Previously on Star Trek Voyager. I am murdered Tuvix. And now, the conclusion. We open to what I presume is San Francisco, based on the bridge. Voyager swoops around a bit while people celebrate, and fireworks, real ones this time, go kaboom. It's not current, though, instead being replayed footage for a news report detailing how Voyager made it back home after a 23-year journey. By my count, that means we've skipped 16 seasons, but that might be for the best. Besides, all of this was 10 years ago according to the TV, a fact corroborated by Janeway's hair. Either that, or the Leola root poisoning finally got to her. Let's skip ahead to a party, where Kim's talking to someone with familiar forehead horns. That's because she's Naomi's daughter, meaning Ensign Mum is now Ensign Grandma. Does that count as a promotion? She runs off as Janeway joins Kim to catch up a little. Tuvok's in bad shape for unspecified reasons, and Kim missed a funeral of some importance. Time, it would seem, has not treated everybody equally. Nor has it treated Paris's hairline well, either. He greets the Doc and a companion as they arrive, the companion revealed to be his wife of two weeks. Oh, and he's called Joe now, the plot element of his name having been swiftly and satisfyingly concluded. We'll leave them to it and join Balana with Janeway. Balana's a diplomatic liaison with the Klingons now, or some shit, which certainly beats getting banged up for being part of a terrorist group. She's been working on trying to help a Klingon lad called Korath, apparently at the behest of Janeway, though the latter is keeping Stumm on her motivations. The Murdoch Muppet's been invited to the party too, which is hardly surprising given his role in helping Voyage around. He leads a toast to the crew on the anniversary of their return, one that Janeway amends with a thought for those who aren't present. Perhaps those sixteen years were harder than events thus far have suggested. We move to the Starfleet Communications Research Building, a place we've seen the Murdoch Muppet working in previously, and whose emblem I've just noticed is off-centre. Perhaps it's been repurposed since we were here last, as they're now hosting classes for cadets, and this one on the Borg has bugger all to do with communications. It does give the chance for Janeway to be a lecturer on the topic, though, and the ensuing question and answer session tells us that Seven of Nine is now a bit of a sore point for her, though she doesn't share why. She's pulled away by a call about Karath, the Klingon Janeway wanted Balana to help out. An ensign, whose surname we learn is Paris, tells her that she's seen what sounds like a gizmo of some sort, the implication being that this is what Janeway wants in exchange for helping him climb political ladders. Sounds dodgy, a conclusion supported by Janeway's next trip. It's to see Tuvok in a medical establishment of some kind, the unspecified issue mentioned at the party apparently being his mind. She's here to say goodbye, as whatever's cracking off with Janeway and Karath, she suspects she won't be back. A visit to Janeway's home later by Joe leaves him curious. It's not like her to be so interested in receiving a physical, and after a little small talk, we broach the real reason for her asking him here. There's an experimental drug called crinexoline, something that sounds suspiciously to do with time fuckery, and she wants some of it. He doesn't look even slightly convinced by her claim that the reason is classified, but he's going to get it for her anyway. Twenty-three years on the same ship has taught him not to bother arguing. Back to the Communications Research Centre, who still have exactly the same lights on at night after a quarter of a century, by the way, so Janeway can chat to the Murdoch Muppet. Whatever's going on, he knows about it and has arranged a package of data about the Borg and a shuttle to take her away. He's also providing a flask of tea, which, at the risk of sounding like a British stereotype, makes him a fucking hero in my book. One final stop before she leaves is the grave of Chicote. If my maths is right, the date on the headstone means he carked it the year Voyager got back. Even in death the character gets fucked over. And many of those intervening years were shit if Janeway's mention of losing an undefined her is anything to go by. That's why she's going to try and improve things, confirming that we're off down the time fuckery rabbit hole. Let's jump back to before all this happened, shall we? Balana thinks it's time to do a bit of going into labour. False alarm, says the doc, and not the first either, as it's common among Klingons. At least it's providing entertainment for the rest of the crew. Kim started a betting pool on when baby Lana will show up for realsies, something we're apparently fine with now that it's not Paris organising them. Janeway invites Chakotay to the mess hall to sample our old friend Chatty Blue Lad's cooking, him having replaced Neelix on poisoning duty, but Chakotay declines as he has other plans. Plans that include a picnic with Seven, this being their third date apparently. 
to the mess hall, where we remind the viewer that Ramrod still exists. He's giving Tuvok a game of Vulcan Kaplunk, and, despite being a relative beginner, wins. Well, that's not right, and a visit to the dock explains why. Tuvok's got something going on with his head meat, and it's not news to either of them. He's being treated, but the dock thinks Tuvok should tell Janeway, which suggests it's serious shit. I guess we know what happens to future Tuvok now. Speaking of futures, Neelix is letting Seven know how his is going on his new home while they play phone call Codiscot. He also asks how the picnic went, it having been his idea, it seems. The game's cut short when sensors pick up a distant Wibbly, and quite a potent one. We all have a chat about it up on the bridge and learn that it's multiple Wibblies in some space fog. Kim thinks the Wibblies might be Swirly's wormhole specifically, potentially making this a sort of transport nexus with multiple destinations. If so, the quantity of them would suggest at least one of them might end up closer to home. Sounds like it's worth a look, so we pootle over to do so. While they look for a way home, let's skip forward again. Tuvox losing his shit in his room, behaviour that's very out of character, says Joe, who it would seem works here. He's repeating a number, and we make a guess at it being a date. That'd put it somewhere in the middle of season six, but there's no episode for it, so it can't have been interesting enough. Joe says it corresponds with Janeway being kidnapped, but Tuvok got her back without any issues. That's not how Tuvok is remembering things, though, saying her disappearance was unsolved. Sounds pretty dodgy, especially when taken with her asking for some medicine with a time-fuckery-sounding name. That's why Joe's decided to ask the Murdoch Muppet what he knows, certainly more than Joe, based on how evasive and nervous Murdoch acts when confronted. While Joe's interrogating, Janeway's meeting up with baby Lana in a cave. It's time to see this Kareth lad to conclude their transaction, but Janeway doesn't want to involve baby Lana any more than she already has, and dismisses her. This means she has no backup when Kareth tries to stiff her on the deal, saying he wants tech from her shiny new shuttle before he'll give her what she wants. She refuses and demands he honour the agreement. He refuses and tells her to fuck off. As negotiations go, that one could have ended better. To the present, again, where we're about to dive into the space fog to look for those wibbly swirlies, what we actually find is a Borg D6. It looks like they saw us, too, as back in Murderbot Central, the Borg Dominatrix is telling the D6 in question to hang back and let them go. Either she has alternative plans for us, or this place is too important to risk Janeway fucking it up. To the meeting room, where we're having a chat about the Borg, Tuvok thinks they didn't spot us because of radiation bobbins from the space fog, but going back for another look might not be a smart choice. Seven's found over 46 ships in there, and Janeway doesn't like those odds, despite Kim's insistence that it's worth a shot. Even Paris turns down his suggestion of asking Janeway to let them take a recon flight in the Delta Flyer Jr., his desire for hijinks now somewhat tempered by the life he has here. And he's not the only one looking at his future. Chakotay's arranging another date with Seven, something that might be a problem. Not because such a pairing is still out of the blue nonsense after three years of thinly veiled hostility between them, though it's that too, but rather because the last time Seven tried relationships in hologram format, it nearly killed her due to a failsafe in her brainial implant. The doc offered to remove it at the time, but warned it might be difficult. The good news is that, upon asking him about it again, we learn he's refined the process and it should only take a single surgery. He tries to prod for the reasons why she changed her mind, but she's not forthcoming. Perhaps his outburst in the last episode is making her disinclined to share the details. To the future once more, and Janeway's gone back to Karath. She says she's reconsidered his new deal, but wants to see the device she was previously promised first. Two can play at changing arrangements, though, so she just teleports away with it. Karath's not chuffed at being robbed and sends both threats and a ship. Neither are successful. Her escape is only temporary, though, as there's someone waiting for her at her destination. Kim's here and says he's taking her into custody, the Murdoch Muppet having buckled under Joe's questions and told him everything. He told Kim, but nobody's made it official yet, because Starfleet is a nepotistic old boys' club and rules are optional if you have enough friends. That's why she convinces him to let her go ahead with a bit of the old time fuckery and see if she can make a better job of getting Voyager home than she did in this timeline. Kim tries to argue, but only briefly. To be fair, he's hardly in the best position to talk about time fuckery, as he's done it twice himself. 
He leaves her to it and buggers off, which means there's nobody around when two of Karath's ships turn up and start pooping at Janeway, just as she's in the middle of doing a time science. A call to Kim brings him back, and pooping abounds. He keeps them busy long enough for Janeway to finish her time science and fly into the resulting Wibbly. Parts of all this are detected by Voyager on the other side of the Wibbly. Future Janeway's shuttle pops out and she gives herself a call, ordering Voyager to close it before some rather irate Klingons pop through and say hi. Some yellow poop does the job, so now that things are a little calmer, Future Janeway tells the current version that she's here to rescue Voyager. All of which presents quite the problem for Janeway, even before you consider the call being intercepted by the Borg dominatrix. Janeway is naturally a little sceptical of future Janeway, which is only fair after experiencing so many ways that this could all be bullshit. She's also not willing to hear too much about the future, just in case it's real, which is going to make convincing her a bit of a pisser. Still, future Janeway's giving it a shot. She goes over the basics of how it's going to take 16 more years to get back, and that not everybody is going to make it, but also says the Borg space fog they passed a few days back offers a different choice. The Doc confirms that future Janeway is who she says she is, while also noting that she's got her own brainial implant. Not Borg this time, but one the Doc's going to invent in a couple of decades according to future Janeway, and it means she can fly any ship with similar tech by thought. That checks out with Seven's opinion of the new shuttle, as she says it's very impressive indeed. In fact, it's packed with gubbins specifically designed to be anti-Borg, and that stuff will fit on Voyager, too. The offer of new guns for Voyager is enough to make Janeway take future Janeway at face value and stop giving a shit about the Temporal Prime Directive. Looks like we'll be going back to that space fog after all. If we'd planned for this to be a surprise to the Borg dominatrix, we're shit out of luck. Seven receives a call from her while she's recharging, something we saw happen previously back in Dark Frontier. Bit odd that we didn't do anything to prevent it since, like sticking the recharging booths in a big old Faraday cage or some shit, but here we are. Anywho, the Borg dominatrix tells Seven that she knows about future Janeway, and that Voyager is heading back to the space fog. She's not best pleased by developments, explaining to Seven that trying to barge in there would go real bad for us, and has the recharging pod Seven's in overload to prove her point. While she's being checked over by the dock, she lets Janeway know what happened. Janeway isn't so sure that this is a good idea anymore, but future Janeway says she swapped violence with the Borg quite a few more times on the way home, and learned plenty from it. We're also carrying guns and armour from a quarter of a century ahead of what we should have. Janeway's still hesitant and is going to keep Voyager on alert, but we're sticking to the plan. Maybe she can't back out now. Everybody is getting used to the idea of being back home soon. Chicote and Seven are discussing what each will do when they return home. Belana and Paris are doing the same, with the added possibility that baby Lana might not even be born on Voyager. Depending on whether Starfleet's willing to ignore the fact that she's still technically a wanted terrorist, Sickbay might be the better option. It's time for Space Fog 2 Electric Borgaloo. It's also time for Janeway to test out some of her sweet new toys, like deployable armour plating, and all while being watched by the Borg dominatrix. 3D6 try to poop green on us, but they all roll critical failures, and we just ignore them. Tractor beams are just as pointless, so they start focusing fire on a single point. That's starting to make a dent, so it's time to return the favour. New fireworks prove particularly kaboomy, which is impressive, as long as you don't think too hard about the hundred thousand or so captive people that we just murderized instead of disabling it. We pop another for the lols, and the third thinks better of things and legs it. Others we see are giving us a wide berth, meaning we're now unopposed as we reach the centre. Janeway wants to know what the bloody hell we're looking at, but future Janeway is more interested in us scarpering through it. Seven answers in her place and says it's basically a Borg train station, a nexus of transwarp pipes to spit ships all over the place. There are only a handful of them in the galaxy, and that news makes Janeway want to turn around. Future Janeway is furious, but Janeway tells her to shut the fuck up, and we scarp her back out of the space fog. We're in astrometrics, so we can use big screen mode for a lesson on Borg transportation infrastructure. The Borg train station has lines running to thousands of places spread across the entire galaxy. That means it's important, which, in turn, means Janeway wants to kaboom the living shit out of it. Future Janeway says it's all shielded up to buggery, so this is pointless, and any delay gives the Borg dominatrix a chance to analyse those tasty new toys we used and figure them out. 
Janeway's not passing up a chance to piss off the Borg, though, and she leaves the others to find out how while she takes a walk with herself. This, we discover, is precisely why future Janeway didn't tell her earlier self what was in the space fog, because she knew that past her would want to fuck shit up. And that's something she can't afford. This way home is the best chance for everybody to make it. In future Janeway's timeline, Seven does a dead a few years from now, presumably killed by something that her minibot resurrection can't fix. And her then-husband, Chakotay, gets very sad as a result. Then there's Tuvok, who gets bad brain syndrome. He can be cured in the Alpha Quadrant, but we don't make it back in time to fix him. Future Janeway also mentions something about 20 other people dying or some bollocks, but they don't have names, so fuck them. Point is, flying home the long way affects people from the main cast, and that can't be permitted. Janeway's on the fence about things now, so chats to Tuvok. It's a simple choice for him, though. One life for potentially millions if we knock out a tactical strength of the Borg. Seven's similarly inclined when talking to future Janeway. She knows the future now and might be able to avoid it, and even if she can't, kabooming something that matters to the Borg dominatrix appeals to her, possibly as some sort of self-imposed atonement for the bad shit what she'd done as a drone. The feeling seems to be shared by all. That's why we're looking at a plan to bollocks up the Borg train station, despite it destroying the best chance to get home. Even Kim's on board. Their united front is enough to convince future Janeway that she's got precisely zero chance of stopping them from going through with it, so she might as well get her hands dirty and help. And, after a little prompting, future Janeway says there might be a risky way of doing both. That's handy, what with this being the series finale and all. Future Janeway's buggering off. We hop aboard her souped-up shuttle, and after giving her an injection for absolutely no reason at all, so don't give it any thought, Janeway bids herself goodbye. The shuttle flies back to the space fog and pops into one of the transwarp pipes at the Borg train station. Some of that flight was watched by Seven, data she shares with Chakotay when he turns up. Oh, and also he's dumped, so he'd best get used to being single. It's almost as out of the blue as their relationship happening in the first place, and it's because of what she was told. If her death is still possible, and that event would proper fuck up Chakotay, then splitting up with him now will prevent that problem. Efficient. Chicote's counter-arguments are a touch forceful, and we could probably have a discussion about the line if you think I'm going to let you end this, but they're in quite a stressful situation even without the potential for imminent Borg death, so we'll give him a pass. It seems to work, anyway. Things are coming to a head in sickbay too, though I suppose the more appropriate term would be crowning. Balana's going into labour, and this one's for realsies. Bit awkward under the circumstances, given they're about to go back into the space fog, but at least that gives her a genuine excuse to get rid of Paris so he can go and do pilot things. Voyager's change of course is relayed to the Borg dominatrix by some of her lads. That's not the only voice she hears, though, as future Janeway is here to have a chat. Not really, of course. This is just a projection using the brainial interface she had implanted by the dock, the one that lets her fly ships with her head meat. As to why she's here, well, she's a diplomat. She's here to come to an agreement. Janeway thinks future Janeway's here to help bugger up the Borg train station, but she instead says she's not happy with those odds. And neither should the Borg dominatrix. Even if it fails, Janeway's going to do a shitload of damage with those new toys. So why go to all that hassle? If the Borg dominatrix agrees to grab Voyager and stick it through a transwarp pipe back home before Janeway knows what's happening, future Janeway will share how to stop all those tasty weapons. Sounds like bullshit to me, which might be why the Borg dominatrix tries to negotiate some additional benefits, like that shiny new shuttle. Not because she's seriously considering the offer, but rather to give her drones time to track the signal and find future Janeway. She's made it easy, too, parked right in front of Murderbot Central itself, where the Dominatrix lives, and future Janeway is teleported in front of her. Bit odd that she's here, but maybe she planned to attack. Still, there's no need for interrogation when you can just absorb someone's brain. It's the perfect victory, future Janeway being slurped into the Collective at her feet, and now Voyager popping into a transwarp pipe where some ships can be sent to kaboom it. Rather a shame for her, then, when that perfect victory turns into utter dog shit. You see, the Borg dominatrix neglected to update her antivirus software, and that's going to be a problem, what with the anti-Borg juice currently flowing in future Janeway's veins. The same juice now seeping into the collective. Things start to kaboom around her, which is just what Voyager was waiting for, as that's how they're lowering the shields on the Borg train station. We fart out some fireworks and kaboom bits of track, all watched by the dominatrix. 
She's a bit busy, though, what with tearing off parts of her body that have stopped working, but she does still have time to send a battle bollock after Voyager, one of the few things she can still contact. And she's able to tell them about the new toys Voyager has, which is going to make the ensuing battle significantly more difficult for us. We're still having a better time of it than her, though. A leg falling off makes her somewhat less regal, and the whole place exploding makes her somewhat less alive, likely along with several billion just freed Borg. Whoops. Back on Earth, they've detected a Wibbly. That's usually our job, but at least the people finding it are connected with us, namely Bad Dadmiral Paris and the Murdoch Muppet. A Borg transwarp pipe opening up about a light year from Earth is clearly not a desired outcome, so Bad Dadmiral sends over everything we've got to get ready for some pooping. Probably just as well, things are getting terribly kaboomy on our side. The whole Borg train station just started detonating, and that tactical testicle is giving Voyager some issues. Kabooming is the least of our problems when it opens up a metal anus on the front of the ship and flies towards us. The battle bollock pops out of the transwarp pipe and is met by a not insignificant amount of ships intent on telling it to get fucked. Much pooping ensues, but doesn't appear to do much. Voyager's fireworks, on the other hand, make a significant mess of it, but that's to be expected when we were inside. Bit of a strategic blunder on the part of the Borg, but I suppose that's to be expected when their entire civilization just got shat on. Bad Dadmiral Paris orders a cease pooping when he sees the battle bollock exploding of its own free will, the final kaboom of which farts out a perfectly fine Voyager. Bad Dadmiral Paris calls to find out what just happened, but Janeway tells him to shut the fuck up and wait for her report. Besides, we're busy, what with the new baby and all. Paris is sent down to sick bay to meet his new daughter, and Chicote takes over at the steering wheel as we fly home. Well then... People who've been around these parts before will probably know that I have two bugbears for Voyager episodes, Time Fuckery and The Borg. Time travel, as I've posited previously, works one of two ways, Badly or Doctor Who. Either you spend ages explaining the minutiae of temporal mechanics and how things link in, or you say bollocks to the lot of it and just get on with things. When future Janeway didn't bother to explain why she was still around even a second after her past self clapped eyes on her, derailing that timeline entirely, at that point we chose the Doctor Who path. Now that's fine. It's better than fine, actually. It's the preferred option. I don't want to listen to a causality loop being explained for the hundredth time. I want to see a Silurian private detective and her wife in Victorian London, accompanied by their Sontar and butler. Who the fuck would rather hear about stuff like the butterfly effect than that? So, not sweating the details is a good thing. I applaud the episode not doing it. Right up until it does. As the Borg dominatrix is getting proper messed up by that virus, she says having a tactical testicle kill Janeway will prevent the existence of future Janeway from a completely different timeline. No, that's bollocks. That's the point at which Rose Tyler saves her dad and Reapers come to kill everybody involved because somebody fucked up time. My point is, you can't have it both ways. If we're being serious, be serious. If we're not, then you don't get to whip out a bit of serious later on as a plot point, especially when it makes no sense on its own merit. You left that serious in your other trousers, mate. All you've got in this pair is not caring. Make your fucking mind up. Okay, the Borg. This I have a little more time for. Not much, as they're still shown to be entirely ineffective yet again, but at least this one has some logic behind it. Future Janeway bringing both tech and tactics makes seeing the Borg brought low again make sense. I still think they're overused, but at least this one kinda works. I wonder how Janeway's going to explain why Voyager's kitted out with tech from a quarter of a century in the future. Just kidding, of course, that'll all disappear into Section 31 along with anything that mentions it, or any one if they're not careful. Speaking of how Starfleet will deal with things, it's frustrating that we saw none of that. We previously hinted at the Marquis situation on Voyager being a bit politically sensitive. To see none of that come to a head is disappointing. I get that's not what the episode was going for, but it's still a pisser after seven seasons of investment. I've got just one more toy to throw out of the pram before I'm finished whining. Seven and Chicote. Now, before you hop to the comments, hear me out. I don't think the relationship works, but that's not my main problem. The issue is the scene in Astrometrics where Seven dumps Chicote. 
it breaks out the piano and strings in an attempt to provide a feeling of emotional investment that it simply hasn't earned. Them getting together, sure, whatever. Them getting together and already being so intertwined in so short a time that it's earned cranking up the very sad music to eleven? No. In a way, it's fitting that the last episode would have such a scene. It's a pretty good example of what we lost by Voyager eschewing slow burn ideas. The whole thing feels as rushed as it quite obviously is. Perhaps given time, this could have been developed into something convincing. The spiritual character with feelings helping somebody find a door in their smooth wall of logic could even have been compelling if played right. Unfortunately, we'll never know. It started a season too late to find out. Oh, and one last thing. Nobody in future time refers to the Doc as Joe after he announces his choice, which is frankly fucking rude. After all of that, you could be forgiven for thinking I hated it. Honestly, no, not really. I don't think it's good, but it could have been a lot worse. One of my main problems with time travel in Trek, that of the big red reset button rendering it all pointless, doesn't get hit in this one, and frankly, that makes up for quite a bit. Of course, it also makes my piss boil at the thought of how good a season-long year of hell could have been, but let's try to end on a positive. I've no complaints with performances. Everybody seems to put in the effort, if only because they're thinking this will be the episode future casting directors look at. I'm being facetious, of course. I'm sure the overwhelming majority of people on the show wanted their swan song to be good for their own reasons, not just to get hired again. Seven years is a long time, and a certain attachment is understandable. But that attachment is over, not just for them, but for us. We're done. Voyager voyages no more. 168 episodes, depending on who you're talking to anyway, have come and gone. For those wondering, the next video will be the Season 7 summary to round off this batch. After that, we'll probably view the series as a whole and look at what worked, what didn't, and what could have done. Might stick a top 5 in that too if I'm in the mood. And after those two have done, there'll be a brief hiatus, probably a couple of weeks, while we prepare for the next great adventure on Deep Space Nine. End of episode. Just like that? We just steal a shuttle? It's that easy? Have you not been paying attention over the last 168 episodes? Fair point. But what happens then? We've got the same problem as if Voyager docked at Deep Space Nine. Prophet's cock ring? Whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is that as soon as this touches the station, it'll stop existing, and we'll get vented into space. Ah, well, you see, I've been thinking about that. Those pylons that ships dock with, they're just for the big lads. The small stuff has docking bays. Really? Well, landing pads. You land on them, then get lowered inside. Well, that's the same problem. Not if we get them to lower it first. Then we fly in through the force field and land on the deck. Shuttle disappears, we fall onto the floor. Remind me why we are not just teleporting again? Because the last one took your bloody face off. That's funny and all, but I don't want it happening to me. Well, here goes then. Woof.